As a gay man, and as someone living with HIV since 1995, uh, this issue is of course personal to me, and development is personal. It's about human beings. So I'm happy to speak to this issue. Um, the paper is a start. It's meant to prompt um, your interest um, as consortium members in contributing to a larger and more formal policy paper that can be used uh, both to inform our partners and inform DIFFIT of this issue. So that's our hope. The law. In 2009, um, a law was put forward uh, that enhanced penalties um, already existing against um, same gender sexual activity in Uganda. And they created a new term, legal term, called aggravated homosexuality. Um, and aggravated homosexuality is when, um, there, well, there's a whole list that you can see in block, in a block <coughs> in background paper. Um, if the offense is committed against someone under 18, if the offender is a person living with HIV. Now, the offender is simply a person engaging in adult consensual same gender activity, sexual activity. So, this wouldn't be an offense anywhere else in uh, the EU or other countries, but it certainly is in, in much of Africa, not just in Uganda. Um, so, anyone in authority, um, so it's so broad that basically anyone accessing HIV services, this homosexual minority in Uganda um, would be liable for the offense. In its first iteration, it was death. Um, in its second iteration, they removed death and made it simply made it life in prison. If someone um, knows that someone's committed or is committing um, aggravated homosexuality, <coughs> quote unquote, and you don't report it to the authorities, um, you're liable for a prison sentence of three years under the proposed bill. I should note it's not law yet, it's in committee. It may never be law, but it is a threat. Um, so all in all, this proposed bill that surfaced in 2009 um, will make it much more difficult to access um, vulnerable communities. The GLBT community in Africa is already vulnerable, so this doubles that vulnerability by far. It also makes it difficult for our members and their partners in country to reach out to this already vulnerable community. So it's an additional obstacle, which is why the consortium has taken this issue on. Um, a little bit of the history. In 2009, um, some evangelical groups, and there are many American, North American principally, almost entirely, uh, groups active in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some of them have specific ministries. In this case, um, Scott Lively, who is the head of what's called the Biden Truth Ministries, which is regretfully based in my home state of Massachusetts. Um, it's an anti-gay ministry. What evangelicals in the United States have found is that as their influence in conservative evangelical and fundamentalist circles is waning in North America and in the United States, it's, there's fertile ground for their activity in other countries, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa. If you go, and many of you have, to places like Zimbabwe, Nigeria, um, in this case Uganda, you will see billboards, expensive billboards, that advertise American television evangelists. In fact, when I was in Zimbabwe recently, a country that has a lot of problems, um, doesn't need to be spending money on expensive billboards for American televangelists, there were several of them. Um, you know, come to the stadium and hear so and so. So, very fertile ground. Um, the problem, um, and this is not in the report, but the problem that happens is that American televangelists come from a very specific political and social orientation. It's not neo-colonialism, it's neo-conservatism. They are neo-conservatives. They really do believe that everyone's an American, they just don't know it. Yet. Okay? It's not even just about religion. It's an, you know, and because of that, they figure that when they have a message, it will be interpreted the same way it would be interpreted back in Iowa or Alabama or California. But they are wrong. 
And so what happened when Scott Lively's ministry was there is that it whipped up a frenzy because he began to say that homosexual persons are a threat to the African family. Not realizing, perhaps, and he says he did not realize this, that this will inflame passions to an extreme. You don't threaten the African family. Um, so the fallout from this, when a member uh, produced a private bill to the Ugandan parliament, was perhaps not expected by these groups who fly in and then fly out. That's what happens. They fly in, they do some damage, they fly out. Okay? So the result was this really serious threat to not only to human rights, not only to the GLBT community, but to people's lives because it will inhibit various services, including HIV services. So I invite you to, to read this um, initial background paper, and I invite you to be part of this policy discussion that hopefully will result in a good tool that we can use both on the ground, in country, and as a, a lobbying tool within the United Kingdom, um, and will be a benefit to the various members of the consortium that are working in the region. It's happening not only in Uganda, but there are anecdotal reports that say it's beginning to gain momentum in Zambia, in Nigeria, in Ukraine, um, in other countries, not just in Africa. It's something that is on the radar and it is a threat. So I invite you to participate in this process. Thank you very much.